we are we are now well into the 20th century, okay? Um, and um, I'm thinking about this time a lot because in the spring I'm teaching the 20th century honors section of English honors, and um, so I'm, I'm beginning to think about what's going on in the early 20th century. Early early 20th century poetry um, is part of the most, probably one of the most important parts of this course. Um, I can't say any longer that it is our century, although when I started teaching this it was the 20th century, um, and we're a whole decade into the 21st century, which is disturbing, but <laughs> welcome to the 21st century. But this poet, T.S. Eliot, along with William Faulkner, are two of the most important writers of the 20th century. And Eliot influences Faulkner, I mean, you can see that in, in his writing. James Joyce is also incredibly important. But it is the poetry that we are now distanced enough from to have a sense of what had a lasting substance, what had lasting substance and effect, and what the effects of the poetry were. But it also um, is, although it's really inaccessible because it's weird, it is also more accessible because we are closer to it. Um, so, for instance, if we read something that was written in, say, 1995, we wouldn't really be sure if it's going to have a lasting impact, it's harder to tell if it's really important, that sort of thing. I mean, you, you can tell some things about the greatness of a work, but, but at, at this point we can look back at Eliot and say he transformed the world of poetry um, and what he was writing um, reflected importance for his time as well as importance for today. Okay. So, it, his poetry, and we talked a little bit about this before, that it is modernism in poetry. This is modernist poetry. It is, it, it, and we said that modernism, or the modern era, excuse me, the modern era began way before 1900. You can go as far back as Shakespeare and Machiavelli. But, um, but the modern problem starts to be really confronted in the early 20th century. T.S. Eliot is directly confronting the question of modernity, perhaps the crisis of modernity. Um, when we look at Eliot, and we'll go back and look at Yeats with the, the Second Coming and um, the Sailing to Byzantium. We didn't do that. We've got to go back and do that. When we look at Eliot and Yeats, um, we're looking at poets that are moderns, though in many ways they're responding or reacting against modernity. They don't necessarily, well, Eliot would not agree with it. Um, they're responding to or reacting against the realism and naturalism and the scientific postulates on which they rest. So to some extent, it's kind of like Candide is also doing the same sort of thing. Um, but in the moderns, here are, here's a list of modern poets, okay, just so that you know. T.S. Eliot, we're going to talk about the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock today. T.S. Eliot. Ezra Pound. Wallace Stevens, that we talked about the other day. Um, Yeats, Y-E-A-T-S, an Irish modern poet. Auden, A-U-D-E-N. And then we've got prose writers, like James Joyce, also Irish. William Faulkner, who is Southern. And Tennessee Williams. We learned about Tennessee Williams in diction class. In diction class. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. With like streetcar and desire and all. Oh, yeah. That um, well, like his text using American songs. He does American diction. So. Oh, okay. okay. These poets were continuous with the Romantics and emerged as Romanticism disintegrated. Both the Romantics and the Moderns are in some ways responding to the same thing, empiricism and scientific determinism. Um, romanticism, you could say, took a heroic stance to redeem humanity from its idolatry of the empirical senses. Okay, so we're going to kind of think about what we've been looking at. We had romanticism that's going to say man from that 
idolatry of the empirical senses. The idolatry of empirical senses. And I want to remind you of Wordsworth and the despotism of the eye. This is like Wordsworth. Wordsworth it's over, it wants to overcome the despotism of the eye. Okay, and so he wants us to, we can, he says, we can see into the life of things when we have an eye made quiet. When, when we forget about our senses, then we can see into the life of things. Uh, into the life of things. Now, Romanticism took this heroic stance also to restore participation of the whole body and spirit in the world. So, it's that attempt to restore the participation of the whole body and spirit in the world. Um, to some extent, I mean, I don't know, do this whole business, this business of I am the poet of the body and the soul, right? Who is that? Who is the poet of the body and the soul? Um. I sing myself. I celebrate myself. Um. It's yourself. We it's read with Whitman. Whitman, yes. Whitman. <laughs> so that's that romanticism, you know, that everything gets to participate. R O N. Romanticism, body and soul, so don't forget the spirit. But the problem with the romantic is that it is esoteric. It loses the communal world. It kind of puts the poet in isolation. You know, you get this sense that Wordsworth is sitting out there by himself in the forest going, oh, what a nice sunset. Um, it's a little bit esoteric. It's not necessary. If you're going to fly off with the spirit, you know, kind of like the happy love, more happy, happy love, you're kind of isolated. And it's kind of something that you can see into, but you know, what about coming back down to where we are all together, right? Where where can we rejoin and find community? Where can we find self and community? That sort of thing. So we've got um, symbolism as a movement, and we've got this that we've got symbolism, imagism, and we can see this in Eliot. Um, symbolism to some extent you can look at symbolism and say that we share you know if there's we can share an understanding through the symbol you can understand share an understanding through the symbol um, although Eliot goes farther than that um, and is working sort of in something called imagism um, to some extent. Prufrock isn't quite that clear, but there is this kind of sense that what is the tr what traditional symbols mean has fallen apart. Do you remember we talked about what happened between 1914 and 1918? Yes, which war? The first one. The first? World, World, World War I, 1914 to 1918. World War One, right? Shattered everybody's faith. 1917, what was there? Oh, there was a flu epidemic. Yes, flu epidemic. 1917, you had the flu epidemic. So 1914 to 1918, we had World War One. We had the 1917 flu epidemic. 
Then we had we had the Great Depression that we're dealing with, and then World War II set in. Um, you also have major changes in both Russia and the South in just, well, 40 years before the turn of the century in the 1860s, you have the Emancipation Proclamation, I think it's 1864, in both Russia and the U.S., where we freed the slaves here, they freed the stars there. You, go, you have a couple of areas where you go from, just you, you kind of catapult these cultures from something that's very medieval to something that's industrial, rational, and capitalist, and and it's it, it just shakes, shakes everybody, shatters everybody's understanding of who they are, where they are, what they are, that kind of thing. And, and it, in the case of the South, you know, there's this situation with people thinking, oh, it's God's will that we fight this war. Well, then the war is lost, and you get this sense of, well, what is God then? Um, who is God? What does he mean? All of that. So you get that in the South before the turn of the century. You get World War I, 1914 to 1918. This is enough to just really undermine faith and a sense of what meaning is. So what what does it mean to be what does it mean to be an American, a European, a human being, a Christian, not a Christian, a communist, if you're if they're one side of the world, the um, a fascist or a Democrat or whatever. All of these things get shattered. And so when we look at, for instance, the wasteland, we're looking at something that is in little pieces. Now, I'm not making you read the wasteland. You're only reading Prufrock, the Love Song of Geoffrey Prufrock that begins on page 2075 in, we're in volume, right? F, sorry, volume F, page 2075. Now, this is at about the same time that we get, I've got to figure out which way it's 